Okay, sorry about the long delay. We said the cabinet went a little bit longer uh, due to a slightly later start. Anyway, uh, by now you will all be aware that I've requested an inquiry by the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security into the circumstances of unlawful inception of communications of certain individuals by the GCSB. I was informed about this issue by the Director of the GCSB on September the 17th last Monday and I referred the matter to the Inspector General the same day. I've asked the Inspector General to identify the facts of this case, assess the circumstances of any errors made by the Bureau and to recommend any measures he thinks necessary to avoid this happening again. I'm disappointed that this unlawful action has occurred and I'm committed to finding out why and how it did happen. The public is entitled to have full confidence that its security agencies will operate strictly within the letter of the law, and on this occasion that does not appear to have been the case. I'd like to clear up one issue that some of you are, have asked about this afternoon. That is, the events at issue occurred after the current Governor-General left his previous role as Director of GCSB. Under the GCSB legislation, the operation in question did not require a ministerial warrant to be signed. Accordingly, I was not asked to sign the warrant, nor was I briefed on the operation in question. A memorandum has been filed in the High Court of Auckland today by the Crown, advising of this issue following that step. My legal advice was that it was then open to me to publicly announce the inquiry, and that's what I did earlier today. I look forward to receiving the Inspector General's report so we can get to the bottom of how this has happened and what could be done to avoid it occurring again. You will appreciate I'm very limited in what I can say because this matter is before the courts and of course is the subject of the Inspector General's inquiry. In terms of the economy, uh, the GDP results uh, last Thursday was encouraging. It showed that the economy was growing at 2.6% over the last year. That's the best annual growth rate since 2007 before the recession and the global financial crisis occurred and it compares very well to other developed countries. It's higher than growth over the same period in the US, Canada, the UK, the Eurozone, Sweden and Switzerland, for example. So even though our economic growth is moderate compared to some other previous recoveries, we're on the right track, especially given the difficult world environment. In these times, it's important to stick to sound economic policy, which is focusing on increasing New Zealand's competitiveness and supporting businesses overall to invest and grow. Uh, you'll also be aware that this morning a senior Taliban weapons dealer was arrested by an Afghan and coalition security force in the Talawa Barfak district of the Baglan province. I'm advised that the detained individual was a weapons dealer and senior Taliban de uh, leader. He had managed the purchase and distribution of rocket propelled grenades, heavy machine guns and explosive materials to attack Afghan and coalition security forces throughout the region. At the time of his arrest, the Taliban weapons dealer was believed to be acquiring additional firearms and explosives for further insurgent attacks. During the operation, one armed insurgent was killed in response to hostile intent displayed by him towards the Afghan and coalition troops. Three suspected insurgents were detained and multiple firearms seized by the security force as a result of this operation. No civilians were harmed during the operation. New Zealand Defence Force personnel did not participate in the operation on the ground, although our people did play a role in gathering information that resulted in the operation. To the House this week, uh, we'll be passing the National War Memorial Park Empowering Bill and progressing the Customs Excise Amendment Bill. We also intend to make progress on the Lawyers and Conveyance Amendment Bill and the International Finance Agreements Bill. In terms of my activity, I'll be here uh, today, caucus tomorrow, and question time on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday, I'll be in Christchurch, on Friday, I'll be in Auckland for events up there. Prime Minister, in relation to the GCSB, can you give an assurance that this was an isolated incident? <coughs> uh, well, that's my belief. I've never had uh, advice um, in the four years that I've been the Minister that they've uh, in any way ever acted unlawfully outside of the advice I received last Monday, uh, which was it was possible that they've acted unlawfully. But now you have to give a 100% assurance? To well, the best of the information I have, but that's why there's a full inquiry. Did they flout the law, or was it a misunderstanding? Uh, look, on the, on the, 
explanation I've had at the moment. It was a, a mistake or an error, uh, but that's now subject to the inquiry by the Inspector General. And in the fullness of time, when we get a chance to see his report, we'll understand exactly what went wrong and why. Prime Minister, was it? I'm not in a position to draw comment on that. How, how many people are involved? You said individuals report. It's a small number, but I'm not in a position to actually comment about who those individuals are or how many. Are you concerned that this weakens the case against Kim.com? I'm not in a position to comment on that. Can you tell us what kind of communication was intercepted? Was it emails or telephone? I'm not in a position to comment. Has the Minister in charge though, do you take some responsibility? No. Why not? Well, simply because I wasn't aware of the fact that the operation was taking place. It didn't require a ministerial sign-off. Um, the first that I heard about it was Monday. Obviously at that point, um, I immediately both gave an indication of my displeasure and also uh, made it clear that a full inquiry would be, required, would be necessary. On that day, I wrote to the Inspector General of Security Intelligence asking him to undertake that inquiry. So, legally, I have responsibility, if you like, uh, for that bureau, um, but there's no actions that I've taken that result in this. Is it an example of intelligence services being too keen to engage in this sort of behaviour? Yeah, I'm not I don't believe so, um, but again, we'll need to see the full. Prime Minister, is it still your position that you were not aware of the operation against Kim.com at all prior to the, the day before the raids on, on Coatesville? Correct. If so, if so, if so, if so, if so, if so we, we were, you were asked this question earlier this year, as your Minister, as Minister of GCSB and SIS, you were not informed at all of this operation? Correct. Do you think you should have been? Uh, I'm not advised a lot of times when they're undertaking uh, operations, so Unlike SIS, where I have to sign a warrant, and I'm obviously aware because it involves New Zealand citizens, in the case of GCSB, the very point is uh, it doesn't involve, by law, New Zealand citizens or permanent residents. So I'm often not aware of who their targets are and who they're, they're gathering information about. Is the legal issue here that these people were New Zealand citizens? I'm just not in a position to go through that. Have they been stood down line? from the... Um, sorry, have they been stood down by this investigation? Has who been stood down, sorry? Uh, no, uh, my understanding is that the Inspector General is carrying out that uh, inquiry. Um, asked him to do that effectively by letter last Monday when I was informed. Um, he's in the process of working through that inquiry. Uh, there are a number of people he would want to speak to. Do you think that they continue there though, uh, while there's an inquiry underway? Um, well, there's clearly been an error that looks to be the case um, at this point. You know, I'm, I'm as confident as I can be, it's an isolated error, so I think it would be okay to carry it on, but we'll, we'll get that information quite quickly. Did you want to announce that? this last week when the Defence Secretary was here, or did you purposely put it back in play? No, I mean, the position is that until we filed the memorandum, filed the memorandum in the court, which happened, I think, at midday today, I, w I was advised by Crown Law I couldn't make a statement. This came How up when did the director find out about it? Why? Sorry. This came up. I think August the 10th, August the 14th, the cross-examination um, of the police involved. Why is it taking so long to reach you as Minister? I can't answer that question. I simply don't know. I was advised, the first I ever heard of this particular issue was Monday the 17th. Is that concerning to you that that had actually been discussed because they went into chambers and other national security, it was discussed that it's taken about six weeks, it's taken about six weeks for it to come to your attention? Well, I can't confirm the first point. Um, and I can't draw a conclusion about the length of time, whether that was acceptable or not, until I know the, uh, see the report and I haven't seen that report yet. Prime Minister, your position appears to be that the police were engaged in this operation against Kim.com for six months under Simon Powers and various other ministers' <coughs> consultation. You weren't informed whatsoever. You were then not informed about this even after it was revealed that there was a gigantic screw-up, even though you're the minister responsible for this agency. Are you, are you seriously saying that you're not concerned about not being kept informed by public servants about matters of national security which impinge directly on, the, on, the, on, the, on your government? No, what I'm saying is that um, there's only been two instances in the entire time I've been in Parliament that I've been informed of a raid or a future uh, it's a raid that's about to take place. Uh, one of those was in relation to the Uru Uras when I was leader of the opposition and potentially subject to those raids. So I was advised for personal reasons. And the second was from memory, that was the 19th of January, when the Solicitor General came to my office to advise me that the next day 
that there would be a raid taking place on this particular individual. In terms of the general um, acts undertaken by the GCSB, they simply don't inform me of those things all the time. The question, the question was, are you happy about receiving the federal office receive, rather than you, anyone in your office or the public promise from the cabinet receive an update or, or, or something of that? Um, not to the best of my knowledge, uh, but again, that's part of what we're working our way through at the moment, is uh, you know, at what point other, other people may have known. But the first I knew was the 17th of September. Um, have you asked your officer, officer that they have their sign off on the operation? No, look, I mean, the, the Inspector General came to see me last Monday, told me this, and that's the first I knew. How, when did it, how did it become apparent that the law was broken? Like, when did UCFB first learn? I don't know the answer to that question. And I, is, um, I'm not in a position to answer the latter point. Um, in terms of the former point, I simply don't know when they knew. Is this Open New Zealand possible? up to potential legal action? Sorry? Is this Open New Zealand up to potential legal action by .com or the I'm just not in a position to offer a view on that. I don't you, know. Have you had any advice on that? No, I haven't had any advice on that. Were you aware of the reports, the media reports, that a security, New Zealand security agency was involved in planning for these raids? No. The first I heard about this was last month. Are criminal charges possible? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question, it's illegal. Prime Minister, you've been accused of dereliction of duty for failing to take notice of these matters no. which are directly in your purview. I mean, are you, what's your response to that allegation? Well, I'll answer all those questions. What's uh, Prime Minister's call the NASA working to? Uh, I think he's working as quickly as he can. I don't know exactly when we'll get the report, but I think I indicated to him, uh, obviously it's a matter of urgency, but he's dealing with that issue as thoroughly and professionally as you would expect them to. And will he report back to the Intelligence and Security Committee? No, he will report back to me. Just to clarify, we're talking about non-approved phone tapping here, are we? Uh, I can't go into the details of that. I do, all I can tell you is that on the information I received from the Director last Monday, it's my belief that um, GCSB has acted unlawfully. These individuals involved, how high-ranking are they? How high-up engagement? It's not a question we've done to this. When did you first hear the name? Uh, 19th of January 2012. Does this tarnish New Zealand's reputation as usually a pretty corrupt and clean country? Well, we're not a corrupt country. No. Um, corrupt free, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think it tarnishes New Zealand's reputation. The, it's quite different. The, the, um, uh, all I can say in the four years that, that I've been the Minister of GCSB in SIS, I've found them to act thoroughly professionally always within the law, which is why I was quite shocked when I found out last Monday uh, that there was an error. Uh, the cause of that error, I can't offer you an opinion on this because I simply don't know. But you can see from the fact that moments after finding out about it, uh, I instructed uh, the Director General to undertake an inquiry, how serious I take the matter. You said you confidence in the Bureau. I do, yes. Why are you so confident that it wasn't the error of the investigation when you started? Um, well, I'm confident it's an error. Opposition parties say they weren't told, they didn't hear about this until media contact this afternoon. Why were they not told earlier as a matter of courtesy? Uh, well, until the memorandum was filed before the court, um, we wouldn't be in a position to make any statements about that. But normally uh, these things are talked about as No, not necessarily. Can you explain why a ministerial warrant wasn't? They're not required because that you only require, you go and have a look at the legislation, you'll see it's quite clear. clear. There's certain examples where a ministerial warrant is required, but in terms of individuals, they're not. So, where, where is it required? When, it when it's a New Zealand resident, and that's when SIS undertake uh, the activities. And is this inquiry, how, is it wide ranging? Is it covering the range of questions that are being asked here? I mean, it being very specific. Uh, it, was broad, it was broad based, I mean, basically. I want to understand how and why the error occurred. I want to understand what actions can be taken to ensure it doesn't happen again. So we've looked at other intersections. We see uh, over a six-month operation, there's potentially a lot of activity. Will it cover that and just these ones in question? Well, it's specific about this operation and about how ensuring that um, there isn't a, a future repeat of this error. Um, I've got no reason to believe an error has ever occurred before. But will it cover other or other activities that are broader than this day or this group? 
Well, it's specific about this particular error and it asks, you know, what safeguards can be put in place to ensure it doesn't happen. So, so it's it's obviously, obviously not a .com's obviously not a resident, so therefore any interception potentially couldn't let it cross the line as well? can't go into this individuals, but what I can say is the advice I've had is that the, the, the individuals involved um, uh, are any information gathered about them would be unlawful. So does that include .com? I'm not in position to comment about individuals. Can you explain why DCFB were involved in this operation in the first place? Um, well, because they gather information when they deem it to be necessary. Why was it DCFB and not SIS though? The um, well, the SIS would become involved if they were if it was deemed necessary and if it was deemed to be people for whom they were New Zealand citizens or New Zealand residents and met the test of requiring a ministerial warrant, in which case I would then have to sign that warrant as the minister. But it was yeah. not believed that any of those individuals met that category. But that wasn't, it wasn't a national security issue. Why, why would the DCSB be investigating this? Well, I'm not in a position to go into the, the, those rationales. Is, 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 this, is this the kind of um, person that they need to be targeting? Some computer guy? Well, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> not really in a position to go into that. Yeah. Sure. What time frame did it happen over, do you know? Uh, I don't know the exact time frame, uh, and I'm not in a position to indicate when it went. I mean, what, what I'm asking is, Kim.com of three international security. I'm not in a position to but what, comment what do you what do you think? Do I'm you, not in a position to offer a view. But do you think that Kim.com is a threat to international security that the GCSB needed to monitor whatever he's doing? Do you, do I you don't, don't have a view on that matter. Well, well the GCSB was changing directors well as often as Japan changes prime ministers. Was that a factor in it? Uh, well, I'd have to read the report to find out. I don't know. Well, have you spoken to whoever was the threat at the time? I haven't. Um, hopefully, I'll give you as much information as I can. Obviously, there's a bit of public interest in that, uh, but I can't absolutely guarantee that the report will be released in full because there may be information that we would want to redact, but I'll take a look at that and come back to you. Prime Minister, you, you told us that you weren't informed about, or you're not informed about any GCSB operations as a, as a matter of routine. What are you informed of by the GCSB about what they're up to? A um, wide range of issues. So they, they inform you about security issues in terms of stuff that they find out? I mean, what, what do you get in your briefing? Well, I'm just not in a position to go into that. When was the director made aware of the error? I don't know the answer to that. How can the public currently have confidence in the GCSB? Well, I think you can take confidence in the fact that, um, at least of my knowledge, I've never been informed that we've had reason to believe there's ever been an error before. Uh, we might, we've self-identified that error. Um, and we brought that into the public. So you said self-identified. It was raised in a court case by, by a, a lit litigious German, wasn't it? Well, I'm not in a position to go into that because we don't have those details, but when it was brought to my attention, I brought it to the attention of the Inspector General, um, and as soon as I was, I was in a legal position to make a public comment, which was in the day to day, I made that public comment. The Greens say that there isn't enough oversight of security issues. Well, I don't think that's ever really been an issue that's been seriously raised before. I mean, the Inspector General, Paul Naser, takes his responsibilities very seriously. <coughs> uh, in terms of warrants that are signed uh, by me uh, in relation to activities undertaken about New Zealand residents or citizens, it's an extremely thorough process. So John <coughs> Jeffries, uh, as the Inspector of Security Warrants, uh, goes through each one of those particular warrants laboriously. Uh, and very thoroughly, and at that point, you know, I only signed the warrant and I'm satisfied with the work he's done. So I'm, I'm actually very confident there's significant oversight, uh, but obviously an error has taken place, for which I don't have an explanation at this point. Have you had any contact with the US for your first Not to the best of my knowledge, no. So who, what's the inquiry <coughs> Who directed the GCSB into the issue? Um, well, I don't have the details of that. Yes. And what? do you know who directed them to do this? Uh, look, I have some information, but I can't tell you all of them. What is that information? Well, I'm not in a position to talk about that. Was it the director? I'm just not in a position to speak to that. What director was um, responsible at the time? Was it in, in the Murdoch period or was it the... I'm not in a position to indicate that. Is the, is the 
city minister responsible for the GCS being SIS, if um, your agent, those agencies are involved or named in a, in a high profile court case and it's, it's published in the national media, uh, it seems strange that you, no one told you about that or did you go out of your way not to uh, be notified of this kind of I didn't go out of my way. I just showed you that was last Monday. Uh, well, all I can say is um, I think um, their, their role in Afghanistan has been helpful. And was there any key soldiers in England at the time that this arrest took place? No, I don't think so. Was the best one Have they begun patrolling? Um, no, we can talk about that at the Are they still gathering um, intelligence for a legal case against that well, I'm not in a position to go into what they're actually doing at the moment. As I said a couple of weeks ago, uh, we dispatched them to play a role in gathering information. I'm assuming that they are going about their tasks. Were the Hungarian troops involved? Not operation? to the best of my information, no. Um, just, you just don't want to look at your coalition partners and act and so forth. Yep. Given the demise of that, uh, the prominent demise of it, <laughs> is, it still, is it still your position um, to rule out Winston Peters as a coalition officer? That's our position, and if we change that position, we'll let you know in 2014 that would be the time frame under which we would consider whether there's a change in that position or not. So um, it was a principal decision that you took in um, 2011 and 8. Yep. If it's, if it's, are you saying it's up for review? Because isn't a principal a principal? No, what I'm saying is every election we take a look at our potential partners, we try and give the public a bit of insight into who we will do business with and who in 2014, what their position is. But, but what, 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 you were so principled about them uh, a year ago and three years before that, saying it wasn't aspiration, it was about yesterday and not tomorrow and so forth. Is it well, I, know where, you, I, I know where you're trying to go, and the answer is, I'll give you an answer in well, 2014. I'm just asking, well, I'm just asking um, if, if it's up for review, your principle, if you like. Well, I have a principle, and the principle is every election year we have a look at that issue. That's what we'll do in 2014. Do, do you believe, though, that he can be uh, a positive force in government in the future? Not really interested in offering a view on that. Why not? Because, not. You, because if you look at even you know, last night's TU1 poll, uh, you can't govern uh, potentially um, without someone. Well, actually, like that's that. not right. On TV1's poll, we would govern. Uh, yeah, 56 seats. Well, we did, yeah. But it it there'd be the wash up vote. And by the way, the 56 no, no, govern. no poll actually. Um, generally translates to exactly what the election night was on. I used that as an example last night, um, the balance of power, I think, may have been Yeah, but we're two years away from an election, a lot of things can happen no, to me. No, but I'm hypothetically looking at it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hypothetically telling you I'll come back to you in 2014. So you can take it as read that, that, um, that potentially you might work with it. No, I'll tell you in 2014 whether we will or not. Solid Just Energy not. has announced yeah. this afternoon that if its restructure goes ahead, 640 jobs will be lost. What do you make of that? Would be very disappointing if that's the case, um, but I know the new chin uh, has been working through the business case very thoroughly, looking at um, all of the issues um, in relation to Spring Creek and others, and the head office in Christchurch. What would your message be to those miners who are hearing that confirmation this afternoon? Well, it's a very difficult situation for them, potentially, and the West Coast, and uh, obviously uh, that would be a very sad day, but um, you know, a company needs to make whatever decisions it makes um, offers the best information it's available to them. Yeah. How the would this affect the flow of solid energy? Well, I think that, as I've said, you know, the, the flow of solid energy is uh, not likely to take place in the foreseeable future, um, simply because the company is going through a process of restructuring, uh, not ruling it out, and part of the mixed ownership program, it's, it's there. But it's quite obvious to everyone uh, that the energy companies are in better shape to be medium or to market as opposed to solar energy. Has the new chairman or the, the management asked for a capital injection from the government recently? Yes, to my knowledge. Has the government considered any information whatsoever? The government's looked very closely at the issue in the, in the essence that the, the outgoing chairman had a view. We asked the incoming chairman to make sure that he's absolutely confident about that position. Uh, they're looking closely at that. What? Well, simply to look very closely at the, the, the merits of any decisions that were made around Spring Creek and, this, and the head office. Would you be in a position to make any capital injection at all? I don't think the issue in relation to Spring Creek is a capital injection. It's a solid. It's a, um, 
well, solid energy, um, to the best of my advice at the moment, as far as I can see, it doesn't require capital injection. Um, but the issue is about the losses that Spring Creek are incurring and about whether it's viable, current and projecting coal prices. There's two different issues there. We've got coal miners coming uh, tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, are you prepared to listen to what they have to say? Yeah, I mean, look, the issue isn't that we're not on their side. The issue is that international coal prices aren't on their side. These job losses, um, alongside the Kiwi Rail job losses, you need to make hundreds of jobs there. What's the government doing to help those people? What will they do to help them get the new jobs? Well, I think what you can see is you know, you've seen very strong growth for the first half of 2012. And I think that's a clear example that the government's policies are working. Um, there are certain specific things happening here. And Kiwi Rail <coughs> has um, a number of lines or a number of issues it needs to deal with and it's working through those issues. In the case of solid energy, it's a victim of falling commodity prices. So there are different issues there. Um, but you wouldn't want to read into the fact that those two parts, that those two companies are going through a tough time. That means that the rest of the economy is failing. It's certainly not. As I said in my earlier remarks, it's growing one of the fastest clips around the OECD. So there's a lot of things the government's been working on, and actually I think you can say they've been successful. It doesn't mean we've got a lot more to do. But in any one year, the economy always loses jobs and creates jobs. The challenge is whether it's creating more jobs than it's losing. In the last couple of years, we've done that. We've created 50,000 extra jobs in very trying international conditions. But and where I'm are those creative. jobs being created then that will help people like these people we see at Kiwi Rail and in Public Paper Mill? and um, at Solid Creek, where are those jobs for those people? Well, in lots of different places. So, I mean, if you think about Christchurch itself, I mean, the massive rebuild the infrastructure demand in Christchurch um, will use a lot of the sorts of skills that are used in some of these mining operations. There are many other parts of the economy that are growing and growing quite rapidly. So there's an exchange of personnel between different industries. That, that is what happens when ultimately um, if you take something like the, the pulp and paper mills, yes, people are buying less newsprint, so that has an impact on their business, but every day there's more people being hired in areas like IT. So there's just a change in the way that people engage in the economy. Um, the, 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 the job of the government isn't to lock people into one industry versus another, but it's to develop a platform which allows the smoothest transfer of possible of people into the industries and parts of the economy that are growing, and to do everything we can to encourage those parts of the economy to grow. That's why 90-day probationary periods are important. That's why reform of the bureaucracy is important. That's why we're doing all of the other things we're doing to liberate the economy. So I think the welfare working... Get jobs. Sorry? So people should move to get new jobs. Well, inevitably there will be that, but that's not a new phenomenon. That's happened since you know the invention of time, hasn't it? There's always been industries which have been at some point um, going through a rougher period or, or going through a period of technological change. So that's always been the case. I think the Welfare Working Group looked at incentives for people <coughs> to move, perhaps. Are you, are you considering those at all? Um, that was really s specifically about, I think, beneficiaries they thought that were trapped in a particular area where there was no jobs. Um, I mean, we've been taking a different approach, which is trying to incentivise employers <coughs> to take people on and the job subsidy schemes and various schemes we, we've announced in the past are useful devices for encouraging employers to take people on. Back to the, back to the Kim.com case, are you disappointed with the with what's happened in this case? It's, you seem to have been dropped in a position whereby, through without any knowledge, you are now having to face the media and an ever, ever increasing amount of criticism when actual, so actually Simon Power and the police and the SIS and the GCSB all let you down. Well, I'm very disappointed that an error occurred. Um, you know, GCSB are a thoroughly professional organisation in my view, and I've never had an experience in four years where they've made a mistake or where there's been an error. The cause of that error is something I would want to get full advice on before I started trying to apportion blame. As soon as I had better information and was providing them in a position to do so, I'll give you as much of that information as I can as I have today. Can I just clarify? You said that the well, the law very clearly spells out when a warrant is required. And it's, it's essentially three categories, but it's if you're a New Zealand citizen, if you're a New Zealand resident, and there's one other part, it's I think on the pathway to a resident, there's a certain technical character, uh, so characteristics. But anyway, it's, it's pretty clear whether you're in that group or not. If you're in that group, 
then a warrant is, is required. And if a warrant is required, then it's an operation undertaken by SIS, and then the warrant needs to be signed by the Inspector General, Sir John Jeffries, and myself as the Minister. If it's a foreign national, then that's not required. So do foreign so nationals not get the same protections as New Zealand residents like the law? Correct. So did they not know he was a resident? Well, I can't go into the individuals, but, uh, but you know, clearly an error has occurred, which means that to the best of the information that's supplied to me, um, unlawful information has been given. So but it's a bit likely to be unlawful because he was a resident. Well, I'm not going to go into all of those details. I'm just saying, to the best of the information, it's been unlawful activity. Did the area even occur in relation to Kim.com, or what, was it one of his co-workers? Can't go into those details. Thanks, Ron. Did it pick up this conversation with your friends? <laughs> <laughs>